You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 209. While both the Polish and the Soviet leaders agreed in late 1919 to take a break from fighting and they began to discuss a ceasefire, both sides knew that this arrangement was only temporary. In both countries, leaders were already preparing to resume the conflict. It was just a matter of who, when, and where. The armies of both countries used this time to prepare for a new round of fighting, with more men being sent into the border regions and a greater focus being placed on making sure that they had the weapons and supplies that they needed. For the Polish army, the situation was clear. They were fighting for the very survival of their new country, or at least the country as they knew it. For the Soviet forces, they would be fighting for the future of the revolution, and also the restoration of some of the land that had been part of the Russian Empire before 1914. When comparing the two armies, it initially appears that the Russians had all of the advantages. They had far more men, with the Red Army possessing over 5.5 million men in total at the start of 1920. To match this, the Polish army had just over a million. However, the Poles were able to make greater use of their available manpower, with a far greater percentage of them being actually combat effective. Millions of Red Army soldiers were either spread out around the country or found themselves stuck in replacement depots, waiting for equipment that could allow them to join combat units. The large number of reserves was still a benefit to the Red Army, and the Polish forces would have no way to replace large numbers of losses if something catastrophically bad should happen. Between the two armies were the people of the borderlands. Most of the early fighting would occur in these borderlands, or the areas between the zones of secure Polish and Soviet power. In these areas, many people who were not directly aligned with either side would suffer from serious violence as both sides moved through during their military campaigns. Throughout late 1919 and early 1920, both sides struggled to control and administer the areas that they had captured by the end of 1919. The Polish authorities found themselves in control of areas with few Polish people, making the control of the territory much more challenging. They would often resort to violence, especially in the areas that were believed to have supported the Russians. The blame for this support fell especially hard on the Jewish populations in the region, who were almost always judged to have supported the communists. As the fighting started up again uh, during the spring of 1920, the violence in the region just escalated. As the two armies moved through the territory, they often committed atrocities, as people who were suspected in any way of helping the other side were either arrested or killed on the spot. The Red Army added the extra violence that was always present in its class-based revolution. Landowners and local business leaders who remained behind when the Red Army moved into a region were at serious risk of being killed. It was really... Just a bad time to be living in these areas, and there was really nothing that they could do about it. All that they could hope was that they survived. The Red Army that was preparing for the resumption of hostilities with Poland was very different than the Red Army that had been fighting the Poles since 1918. This was the post-Civil War Red Army, and that meant that many of the improvements that had been made by the Russian military to win the Civil War were now also present in the army that would attack West. At the highest level, the army was still controlled by dedicated communists, with Trotsky still a member of that group. However, there were large numbers of old Tsarist officers that were actually leading the army. Officers that had been brought in during 1918 and 1919, and over the previous year had proved their loyalty and leadership abilities during fighting with the Whites. 
There had been some defections to the white armies early on, but after a year of fighting them, and with the white forces being by early 1920 far past their point of greatest strength, there would be few desertions during 1920. One thing that I probably have not discussed enough is that due to the structure of the Red Army and the general loyalties of the officers and the men, the people commanding the Red Army at this point were far younger than the officers in the army had been during 1917. It was not all uncommon to see armies and army groups that were led by men in their 30s, positions that would have been occupied by men in their 50s and 60s during the First World War. This brought with it new ideas and new ways of fighting, which both sides would take advantage of in the coming campaign. While the overall effectiveness in the soldiers and officers of the Red Army was greatly increasing, the weapons that they had available were also increasing both in quantity and quality. This was due to a combination of increased local production and British and French weapons that had been captured from the White Armies during the defeats and retreats of 1919. This allowed the Red Army to bring much more firepower to the front than they had in the past. They had also found new and interesting ways to introduce more firepower onto the battlefield, my favorite of which was the Tachanka. The Tachanka was a horse-drawn cart or buggy that had a machine gun mounted on it. This was a setup that had been used during the First World War, but would see much greater use during the Civil War and Polish-Soviet War periods. The ability to rapidly move a machine gun around the battlefield was a great asset, and it allowed the gun to be rapidly repositioned to provide fire support for an attack or defense, and then it could just gallop away before the enemy could properly react. This is just one example of how both sides tried to increase the mobility and firepower of their forces. Another was simply a much greater emphasis on mounted troops. Both sides would field a higher percentage of cavalry than was typical during the First World War, and they provided a much greater part of both armies' fighting capability. Even though both Polish and Russian cavalry had the same basic goals, they did choose to accomplish them in slightly different fashions. The Russian cavalry was generally less organized but had larger numbers, and the more disciplined Polish units were often smaller. No amount of mobility could prevent the two armies from having to work around certain geographical features of the areas where the fighting would occur, and these were the geographical features between Western Russia and roughly Warsaw, where the Soviet advance would end. In this area, the Poles and Soviets would have to work around the same geographical features that had caused so many issues during the First World War, and would again during the Second. The entire front occupied by the two armies was over a thousand kilometers long, however not all of this territory was suitable for large offensive operations. In the north, the new countries of Latvia and Estonia forbid either side to march through their territory, and there were also large numbers of lakes and forests which impeded movement. Then on the southern end of the front, the Carpathian Mountains and the Dniester River reduced the ability of armies to campaign, and so they would be funneled northwards. This forced all of the fighting into the central area of the front, and this area had its own geographical features, the most noticeable of which was the Pripyat Marshes. These marshes, roughly 60,000 square miles of them, were broadly a triangular shape, and this caused some issues for both sides. For the Russians, it would mean that any advance to the west would need to occur on both the north and south sides of the marshes, which would split their forces, but allow the Polish army to concentrate as one unit on the western end of the triangle near Warsaw. If the Polish army then wanted to also advance, they would also have to split their forces, but at least they would meet a Russian army that was similarly divided. These problems and the slight Polish advantage in the defense would shape the fighting during 1920. All of the geographical oddities of these areas where the fighting would occur were incredibly important because the fighting would be very different than the mostly static fighting that had occurred before 1918. Neither side would be able to construct or man large defenses that would slow the fighting, and this meant that the fighting in 1920 would be far closer to the war of movement that the generals of 1914 had dreamt of than the trench-bound reality of the First World War. 
As I mentioned last episode, Pilsudski and the Polish army planned to attack into Russia as quickly as possible in 1920. They were aiming for April as the start date for this offensive, a date chosen because it was the earliest possible time that an attack could occur but still avoid the worst of the winter weather. This early attack was believed to be absolutely essential, because all of the Polish leaders were fully aware that if the Red Army could fully prepare, then it would be stronger both in terms of manpower and in its capabilities. The early attack would allow the Polish army to disrupt Soviet preparations, but to launch an early offensive, the Poles were forced to focus their attacks to the south of the Pripyat marshes, but this did also provide the benefit of allowing them to assist the Ukrainians in trying to create an independent Ukrainian nation, which, if it could be created and secured, would be very helpful to an independent Poland as a balance against Soviet Russia. As with many engagements during the Polish-Soviet War, especially in the early stages, I don't think I can give you exactly what the numbers were in the armies when the Poles launched their opening attacks. Even if we could determine exactly how many men were available in both armies in Ukraine in 1920, there would still be other factors that would make it challenging to determine how many men were actually available to each army at the front. The Red Army had the biggest problems to deal with, which pulled many units away from the front lines. The biggest cause for concern was due to Ukrainian partisans, a constant drain on Soviet manpower in the region. This pulled men away from the front as well as caused supply problems that would have to be solved. These problems were exacerbated by a mutiny that took place right before the Polish attack. This resulted in two brigades of Red Army troops who had been stationed in the area mutinying and abandoning the communists in favor of the Ukrainian partisans led by Petrula. These troops, along with those of Petrula, then worked with bands of white soldiers who were still active in western Ukraine, along with anarchists under Makhno, to just cause problems. I know that all sounds a bit confusing, but the basic concept was that even those areas that the Red Army were occupying in western Ukraine were not truly controlled by them. The control of the areas was very fluid, which resulted in a Red Army that had many things to consider and deal with even before the Polish attack had was launched. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half and the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy.
The offensive would begin on April 25th, and during the first few days of the attack, they would experience almost complete and total success. In just the first day, the 3rd Army would advance 55 miles from its starting point. This represented an advance far larger than expected, and instantly the goals for the offensive were expanded. The 4th and 6th Armies then joined in the attack as well, and they also began to advance. All around the front, Soviet divisions and units found themselves either cut off or surrounded, and or they were in very rapid retreat. In many areas, the equipment, and especially the artillery, would have to be left behind in a frantic dash to the rear. Retreating was at this stage the best option available. Many units that actually had the ability to stand and fight were quickly cut off since all of the units around them chose to run. The majority chose the path of retreat though, and they saved their strength for another day. This allowed the Polish troops to continue to advance toward their primary goal, the city of Kiev. On May 6th, Polish cavalry would approach the city. The Polish plans had, been, had taken into account the assumption that the Russians would defend the city rapidly, but instead, when the Polish cavalry arrived, they found it almost completely abandoned. This was in some ways good, and, and also bad, for overall Polish objectives. Capturing the city was of course fantastic. It was one of the overall goals for the attack. However, the fact that it was undefended and that the Red Army had for the most part retreated from the Polish advance meant that there had been no available opportunities to trap and destroy the Soviet forces. The Red Army already had an advantage in terms of manpower, and capturing some square miles of Ukrainian territory didn't really change that equation in any meaningful way. Instead, the Polish troops just had to halt the advance after arriving in Kiev. They could not really advance much beyond the city, and so they had to reevaluate the entire situation before determining what to do next. Up to this point in the attack, things were going incredibly well for the Polish forces. During just two weeks, they had attacked, advanced all the way to Kiev, a distance of 200 kilometers, defeated two Soviet army groups, and rounded up 30,000 prisoners. But as I mentioned, they had not captured as many prisoners as they had hoped, and this left Pilsudski feeling a bit concerned. The entire Polish strategy had been based around a rapid advance to throw off the Soviet preparations, and while they had done this, they had not been able to damage the armies in front of them as much as they'd hoped. Instead, the army had rapidly turned to flight. This meant that the Poles either had to continue on the attack, or they had to find a new place to attack. Otherwise, the Soviets would be able to recover and launch their own offensive. With this new advance, the Polish army was also now in a position where they had to deal with all of the problems that the Red Army had been trying to work through when they were attacked. They now had to try and administer, organize, and control the areas of Ukraine that they had just captured. The leader that they hoped to put in control of the area, Petrula, would prove to not be in any way up to this task. To be completely fair to him, he did not really have much of a chance. While he had Polish support and some supporters within western Ukraine, he also had to deal with a large anarchist presence under the, under the leadership of Makhno, and white forces in Crimea under Wrangel, and he was of course still fighting against the Reds in the north. The Petrula government would last less than a month, a very short space of time, and a short-lived benefit for the Polish attack that did not in any way justify the cost. Because even if the attack did not cost a large number of Polish troops, it had overextended their army into a large new area that brought them little in terms of advantages. This overextension would then become a huge disadvantage when the Soviet attack began. As one Polish soldier would say, we ran all the way to Kiev, and we ran all the way back. Along with causing some issues for the army around commitments and overextension, the attack in Ukraine caused some political issues for Pilsudski, or at least provided some political benefits to his enemies. Privately, the Soviet leaders were not greatly concerned about the Polish attack. However, publicly, they would use it for the huge propaganda boost that it could be among the Russian people. As was so often the case in history, and even during the Russian Civil War, the communist officials were able to use the invasion of a foreign power to bolster their support on the home front. The announcement from the party, which was released on April 29th, would say, quote, Honorable citizens, you cannot allow the bayonets of the Polish lords to determine the will of the great Russian nation. The Polish lords have shamelessly and repeatedly shown that they care not who rules Russia, but only that Russia shall be weak and helpless. 
This brought many people over to the communists that may have been at the very least on the fence about their control of the country before the Polish attack. It really could not have been a better time for the communist leaders to gain this new support, with the white armies defeated and all efforts being put on consolidating their power within Russia. They had been given a gift by the Polish advance, a legitimate national outrage that could be channeled against a foreign army that in reality posed very little real threat to Russia as a whole. Before the Polish army began even moving towards Kiev, the Red Army was already planning its own attack. After the start of the offensive, they were in some ways excited about where the Poles had chosen to attack. There were two parts to the Soviet counterattack. The first would be an attack directly against the new Polish positions in Ukraine, and then this would be followed by a more general offensive across the entire front. For the counterattack in the Ukraine, they would heavily utilize the 1st Cavalry Army, or as it was often referred to, the Khan Armia. This was a force that had been initially formed in November 1919, as a reaction to what had been experienced when fighting the White Armies. During that fighting, the Red Army had been at a disadvantage due to the prevalence of Cossack cavalry units in the White Armies. To combat this threat, the Red Army formed the 1st Cavalry Army, which was made by essentially just taking all of the cavalry units available, or most of them, and putting them all together. This gave them simply overwhelming numbers in many of their engagements. By the time that it was transferred to the Polish front, the Khan Armia had 16,000 men, with many of them being fresh recruits that had been brought in early in 1920. This force would be on its way to the Polish front before the attack on Kiev, and as early as March, discussions had started about moving them from the Caucasus region to the Western Front in anticipation of the Soviet attacks later in the year. This put them in prime position to participate in the counterattack. That counterattack would begin on May 26th. For the first several days of the offensive, things did not go well for the Soviets. They had very poor intelligence about the state of the Polish defenses in front of them. They were in reality much stronger than they believed, which caused the Soviet army to spread out over the entire front instead of focusing their strength properly. There were also some issues in the tactics deployed by the cavalry, and its commanders met on June 2nd to discuss what was happening. One of the important changes that would have to be made was a shift in tactics away from what what they had been using against the white forces in the south. This had involved cavalry charges even against prepared positions, a strategy that had worked against the white defenses but had failed completely against the Poles. The Soviet commanders decided to change tactics, and instead of just charges, they would instead begin to attack the Polish fortifications in dismounted formation. They were essentially turning their cavalry units into dismounted infantry, and it would work. When the attack began again on June 5th, a string of successes would begin that would not end for two and a half months. This unbroken string of successes was impressive for many reasons, not the least of which the fact that the Russians did not greatly outnumber the Polish defenders, and the Russian logistical capabilities were almost non-existent. Even with these handicaps, they were able, once they dislodged the Polish defenders, to keep enough pressure on them through constant attacking to prevent the defenders from ever stabilizing the front, resulting in a retreat that would only end months later and far into Polish territory. With their advance into Poland, the Russians would create the Polish Provisional Revolutionary Committee, or Polrevkom. This Polrevkom was created by the Russian communist leaders to coordinate and control all of the revolutionary and political work involved in creating a communist Poland after the invasion of the Red Army was complete. There was a concerted effort to make it clear that the Polrevkom was separate from the Russians. The leaders were all Polish, and they made it clear that the arrangement was only temporary, with a new government to be created by the Polish workers after they were unified and the nationalists in Warsaw were overthrown. From the very beginning, they would run into a huge variety of problems that would very quickly result in the downfall of the Polrevkom as a concept. As was so often the case, the most pressing issue was food. The new committee had to try and grapple with supplying the cities with food, and that meant either getting it from the peasants or taking it from the peasants. They chose the former policy and negotiated with the peasants to try and secure a food supply. This This would cause later problems, but was necessary at the beginning because the peasants in Poland were very different than those in Russia that the communists had dealt with before. 
they were generally wealthier and more organized, and with the limited strength available to the Polrevcom, it meant negotiating was really the only option. This is just one example of the fact that there were many problems for the Polrevcom to try and solve, but most of their problems would be rooted in the fact that they did not enjoy the support of, well, anybody. And they also did not have a single leader who could make decisions. Instead, there were various members who all had roughly the same amount of control, and their power swayed back and forth, which meant that depending on the situation at the time, a different decision may be made in the same circumstances based on the exact specifics of power within the committee at the time. Even if the decisions were completely consistent, that would not have solved the problem of support. They simply did not have enough of it. Even the Polish Socialist Party would declare their support for the government in Warsaw, mostly out of concern that the Pol Revcom was just a puppet of Moscow. This left the communists with only one option, the Red Army. And next episode, we will join them on their advance towards Warsaw.